Hey everyone, uh, or as we say in the South, hey y'all. Hey y'all. <laughs> Brandon, you live in Ohio. But I'm from Texas, so I'm I am from Texas, the South. Te Texas is not the South. We were part of the Confederacy. Does that count as the South? Uh, You're you from Alabama. Say, hey, look, if you want to count that, if you want to count that, go ahead. Uh, okay. Yeah, I don't so, want to count that actually. I don't want to own the Confederacy. <laughs> no. I'm, I'm actually just going to take all that. No, you can have it. You can have it. Okay. No, I don't want it either. Uh, <laughs> so, okay. We're on episode two of the Center for Baptist Renewal podcast, and it's already off the rails. Uh, that's what we get for not having Luke here, who tries to keep us on track. And he, is our, he is our dad. He keeps <laughs> us in, in yes. control. That's right. Okay. Hey, y'all. Start there. Welcome to the Center for Baptist Renewal podcast. I'm Matt Emerson. I'm on, the, I'm on the board of directors here at CBR, and I'm joined by Brandon Smith, who's also on our board of directors. And we're a group of Orthodox Evangelical Baptists committed to retrieving the great tradition for the renewal of Baptist faith and practice. If you enjoy what you hear today, who knows if that's going to be the case, uh, we, we invite you to check out our website at centerforbaptistrenewal.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at, at Baptist Renewal and on Facebook at facebook.com slash Baptist Renewal. Also, don't, my kids do this all the time. They walk around the house saying this stuff. Don't forget to subscribe and tell your friends. Uh, in today's show, we're actually going to start walking through our 2021 reading challenge, and we're going to start with Irenaeus's on the demonstration of the apostolic preaching. And I'm going to say Irenaeus today because Brandon insisted on it. Also, our friend Stephen Presley says it that way, and he's he has a PhD in Irenaeus, so I guess I should follow his lead. Well, John uh, Bear also translated and edited the version that everybody's well, reading, and he John says Bear, it that way. John Bear isn't Southern Baptist, so. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Neither am I. Fair. Okay, how about we kick it off with Brandon telling us a little, about, a little bit about Irenaeus' context, um, and then just an intro to the text that we're about to talk about. Yeah, so... One of the things we decided to do with this is try to give a summary of sort of the background and context and even some of the uh, theological presuppositions of the authors. So you'll be uh, assumedly reading through this if you're following us on the reading plan. So you will uh, read a lot of this. And so what we don't want to do is just kind of go through and read the chapters to you or tell you everything that happens, but give you more of a framing uh, in a context. So in terms of Irenaeus, he is born somewhere between 125 and 130 AD. So we're talking about somebody who was born within or around 100 years after the life of Christ. Uh, he was uh, a, a disciple of, or at least uh, heard Polycarp uh, on many occasions preach, and Polycarp is said to have been a disciple of John the Apostle. Uh, and in fact, Irenaeus and others in some of their writings will go back to this idea of, hey, we know the apostles, or we know people who knew the apostles, you know, when, when they're defending uh, <laughs> the apostolic tradition. Yeah, that's a, uh, you don't get uh, many more uh, dunks on people than that. Oh, really? I know John. Um, <laughs> but Irenaeus will, will pull that one out every once in a while that he knew the guy who knew John. Um, and so the point to bring that up is that Irenaeus is, is really close to the life of Christ, is really close to the teachings of the apostles. And so when we think about Irenaeus saying, this is how the apostles preach and teach, which is a big part of this book, um, or this, this writing, you're seeing somebody who would know, right, uh, conceivably, unless he's just a big liar and has decided to completely ruin the apostolic tradition and everything that they left behind, which I assume he didn't do. Um, you know, his main opponents that he brings up in here are, um, you have Marcion, uh, particularly, uh, you have a little bit of uh, the Valentinians as well. And these are different groups that are kind of uh, generally put under the umbrella of Gnostics. And so the Gnostics are not a monolithic group per se, but a couple of principles that make up Gnosticism. Uh, one of them, and one of the ones you'll see Irenaeus argue against, is this idea that there's some sort of special knowledge or a knowledge of the scriptures outside of what the apostles have left and what the writings say. So the Gnostics will say things like, well, you're, the apostles say this, but our teachers say this. Uh, Marcion denies the authority of the Old Testament, uh, basically says that the God of the Old Testament is not the same as the God of the New Testament, because the God of the Old Testament is angry and confused and created a terrible world. Yeah, that's a very strong paraphrase of Marcion. Hmm. Um, and so you have this, uh, this argument that scripture is not unified, and that Paul and Luke don't agree with each other. For example, you'll see some of the, the Gnostics say this. And so that's kind of the background to this is that uh, Irenaeus is defending uh, the apostolic tradition. And so this sometimes will get posed as, um, you know, whatever, 
pre-Catholicism, popes, like all those kind of conversations. That's not what he's doing here, right? He's saying, no, this is what John said. This is what Paul said. He, when he talks about the apostolic tradition, it's not that, and it's not sort of some of the weird things we see now where people claim to be apostles and, and all kinds of stuff like that, right? He's talking about the actual apostles uh, mm -hmm. who actually wrote these things. And so uh, he's defending uh, the unity of scripture and defending um, how we can say that the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament, quote unquote, are the same and how Christ is the fulfillment of uh, the Old Testament witness. So that's kind of your background uh, to what's going on there uh, in, the, in the writings. Yeah, that's good. Uh, so I think we could say then, given, given the emphasis on the unity of scripture, and really you might even say on the story of scripture, we, we could say that Irenaeus is the OG biblical theologian. Uh, not Gerhardus Voss. How dare you? <laughs> How dare you? Just to troll my, <laughs> as, as usual in every episode, it's going to happen just to troll my Reformed Baptist friends and, and Presbyterian friends. Uh, but then to troll my biblical scholar friends, uh, J.P. Gabler isn't the father of biblical theology either. Mm -hmm. um, Irenaeus created a false dichotomy that Irenaeus does not accept. That's right. Um, biblical theology and systematic theology it should just be called christian theology hey we're reading the bible about jesus hey, that's, that's what interesting. theology is that's novel <laughs> yeah that's right uh so <laughs> so in in doing in in combating um marcion and combating gnosticism in this way as brandon said irenaeus is trying to um, emphasize the unity of scripture and really in doing so, what he's emphasizing is that scripture speaks of the one God who makes himself known in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And that's the unit, that's where we find the unity of scripture, that it's a, it's from the same God about the same God and about the same person in whom we know God, who is Jesus. Um, and so R.R. Uh, R. Reno and, and John O'Keefe uh, describe Irenaeus's hermeneutic using three categories, and this isn't necessarily unique to them, but um, if you're looking for a little intro to, to Irenaeus's hermeneutic, that'd be a good place to, to jump, and it's in a book called Sanctified Vision. Um, they talk about three strategies that Irenaeus uses hermeneutically, and you can find this in Against Heresies. You certainly can see it perhaps even more clearly in the text we're talking about today. Uh, he, he, Irenaeus, Irenaeus, sorry, Stephen and Brandon, uh, Irenaeus talks about, and John, talks about hy the hypothesis of scripture. And so, you know, when we think about hypothesis, we think about scientific method, we think about a theory, or we think about a, a posit that we're making about some, some problem. Um, it's a little bit different, although the concept is, is similar uh, with Irenaeus, that there is a, the text is about one thing when Irenaeus talks about hypothesis, um, that the, the text has one meaning uh, and yes, we have to prove that, right? And so with a scientific method, you have to prove your hypothesis, right? But you're still stating your hypothesis up front, namely that this piece of evidence points to this reality or something like that. Yeah. Um, and for Irenaeus, the hypothesis of scripture, that is its, its meaning, how we understand it, is simply the person and work of Jesus. So it's all, you know, to say it really simply, the Bible is all about Jesus. And the, the work of hermeneutics for Irenaeus, the work of interpretation is to prove that, not, not in a kind of um, modernist empiricist way, but to show it, to mm -hmm. demonstrate it, right? And so this book that we're talking about today is, is sometimes you see it called On the Apostolic Preaching. Sometimes you see it called The Demonstration of the Apostolic Preaching, um, right? So the, the SVS Press uh, volume that we've linked to on our site calls it just On the Apostolic Preaching, but... Um, it's actually, it's actually in Greek, it's demonstration, right? We're, we're demonstrating something. Epidixis. Yeah. And so um, what Irenaeus is trying to do is demonstrate the truthfulness of his hypothesis. He has this illustration about how scripture's a mosaic. And in a mosaic, you can take the tiles and you can make different pictures out of those same tiles. Um and that's what the Gnostics do and the Marcionites do. They, they take the tiles and they rearrange them in ways that don't actually make sense. Whereas what Irenaeus is trying to do is say, if you put these tiles together properly, that is according to the rule of faith, then what they show us when you put the whole Bible together, 
what the, what those tiles together show us is a picture of, and he calls them the handsome king, the wise king, Jesus. So this is Irenaeus' starting point. And of course, we could walk through why he starts there. But, you know, just very briefly, Luke 24, Luke 16, John 5, Jesus tells us where to start is, mm -hmm. is essentially the point. Jesus tells us where to start interpretively, that the Bible is all about him. Uh, but then he also employs two other interpretive tools. Uh, the uh, He calls it the economy or oikonomia and uh, recapitulation. And so with the economy, we're talking about there's a particular way that these tiles are put together to make that picture. So there's a shape or an order um, to, to the way that this material is put together. And we, you know, today we talk a lot about the story of scripture. And that's one way that the tiles are put, are put together, the pieces of scripture are put together, but there's more to it than just broad story. It's, it's sequence of events and these sorts of things. Um, and then the third tool that Irenaeus talks about is recapitulation. So if in the economy, we're talking about that if you take all the tiles together, the shape of them points you to Jesus and specifically the, the narrative sequence of the tiles points you to Jesus. With <clears throat> recapitulation, what we're talking about is taking an individual tile, whatever that might be, and showing how it is um, culminated in the story of Jesus. So the difference between those two, we'll use an example. Um, the difference between those two would be something like if you were to look at um, the story of Hannah and Samuel, right? Uh, in the economy, the story of Hannah and Samuel fits in the sequence of events where Samuel leads the way to uh, anointing King David. And of course, that is a sequence of events that leads to Jesus um, being anointed the son of David and also son of God by John the Baptist. Mm -hmm. In recapitulation, we're talking about not only does this story fit in the narrative sequence, but also if you look at the details of this story, it actually matches the details of Jesus's life or of some, some event surrounding Jesus's life. And so with Hannah and Samuel, you're talking about barren woman going to pray in the temple. She gets pregnant. The, uh, she, she takes a, a Nazarite vow on behalf of her son, the son becomes the anointer of the king of Israel. Those details match onto Elizabeth, Zechariah, John the Baptist, mm -hmm. Jesus, right? So in economy, we're looking at sequence of events um, leading up to the event of Jesus. In recapitulation, we're looking at how details of those events map onto details of, of Jesus's life. And we could multiply examples like that. We'll, yeah. we'll come back to some of them, but those are the broad strokes of Irenaeus's hermeneutic, his interpretive method. The whole Bible is about Jesus. It's structured to point us to Jesus, and individual stories map onto the story of Jesus. Yeah, and a lot of that plays into uh, this idea of the rule of faith, uh, which um, mm. if you're watching, you may have heard of. Um, you know, the rule of faith wasn't invented by Irenaeus, but in fact, he, he sort of uh, leans into it when he says some of these things. So the rule of faith I mean, there's, there's a lot of debate about uh, where it came from. Most people say the rule of faith was probably the Apostles' Creed or a version of the Apostles' Creed that predates Irenaeus. Um, and it's the general principle that because God is unified and authoritative and tells the truth, uh, therefore, the scripture that he gives us is ordered unified and tells the truth and authoritative, right? So um, this you see it a little bit in chapter six uh, of demonstration. You'll see where he'll say, this is our faith or this is the rule of our faith. And he basically says, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, yada, yada, yada. Uh, he'll do this more extensively in Against Heresies as well, which really this is a, a kind of a, a summary of a lot of that kind of stuff. And so you'll see little pieces there. But the rule of faith ends up being this thing that he has picked up on that carries all the way into uh, even into Nicaea in the fourth century. There's always this assumption that because God is unified, uh, so is the scripture that he has left. And so I remember hearing, uh, you know, an undergrad Bible major, I remember one of the first hermeneutical principles I ever learned was uh, interpret difficult passages of scripture by the clearer ones, right? If you've got a passage that you can understand, if you've got five other ones that are very clear, 
there's not a contradiction there. Perhaps uh, it's you know more difficult to understand. Use the clear ones to help you understand that. Well, Irenaeus literally says that in Against Heresies, and he does that a little bit here. So kind of going back to uh, the mosaic idea, that's kind of his idea is if you're looking at, uh, you know, illustration I've used with students is if you're looking at a puzzle box, you have the picture of the puzzle, and then you open it and you've got all the pieces strewn out on the table. Well, you know where the corners are, right? And you know where maybe the big piece where it's the person's face pretty clearly okay I can start using these really clear ones and then I'll piece in these little weird ones that have four colors that you don't know where they go right. uh, together that's how he says to interpret scripture right yep. is that you take the clear ones uh, and and use those to help you understand the more difficult ones and so one of the things that he will do in this uh, book is just walk through here are a bunch of passages that are pretty clear like one of the examples you just gave of, of how the Old Testament testifies to who Christ is and how this is a unified story, again, as a response to uh, these different versions of Gnosticism that are denying the unity and mm. authority of scripture and what the apostles say. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so what you'll find with Irenaeus is, you know, these various uses of rule of faith, which weren't, you know, this, this isn't a podcast episode about the rule of faith per se, but it's just an interesting topic. Um, and, and in various places, you'll have like what, what Brandon has said, you'll have um, something like uh, the Analogia Fide, where it's interpreting scripture in light of scripture. Um, in other places, you've got him referencing baptism. Uh, you've yeah. got him referencing some kind of doctrinal summary. Um, and then in other places, it's just the, sort of the point of scripture is Jesus, and that's the rule of faith. So uh, we don't... I would say that, you know, this isn't, this episode isn't about the regular, but just to be clear, we're not saying that there's one very clearly defined regular in Irenaeus, but yeah. the, the regular, uh, at least in my estimation, is a broad stroke statement of the summary of scripture. Yeah. And that can be a doctrinal summary. It can be a narratival summary. It can be a content summary. Um, a, a, a term that Brevard Childs employs a lot in, in his work is sock critique. This idea that there's there's an overriding um, there's an overriding general content that is the point of some yes. book or, or 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 work or whatever. And of course, Irenaeus isn't doing that because he's not a 19th century German. Um, <laughs> but but that's kind of the idea in that content summary. Yeah. So. It's about Jesus. What that means narratively is that the story points to Jesus. What that means doctrinally is, you know, essentially later on the Apostles' Creed, uh, which yeah. if you and if you read the Apostles' Creed, it's a story that centers on Jesus too. So, yeah, um, yep, yeah, it is. It is a little bit. You know, Lewis Ayers talks about uh, the pro Nicene. You know, that there's these differing ways that they will talk about doctrine. These different ways that they will use, they'll use different phrases to mean the same thing. And mm. um, he talks about you know kind of a, a culture or a general consensus of here are, here are the mm. types of things that they would say. Uh, I'm reading his work on Augustine right now, where he says, you know, Augustine, clearly you see him start picking up on some of the language that Nicaea uses and, and starts finding a boundary there, right? And I think maybe we could describe the rule of faith that way, that, that there are differing ways it's employed and described, but it is a, it's a, a culture or a theological culture, maybe like a sixth sense that like, mm. this is kind of how you're supposed to read it. And these are the presuppositions you have and they can play out uh, in different ways. Right. Yeah. And, and, and if you read through the first part of demonstration, um, Irenaeus, at least in my opinion, seems to begin with something like a doctrinal foundation and then yeah. moves into reading the story of the Bible. So it's, it, it's, it's, here's who God is. He's, Father, Son, and Spirit. That's what this means. And then mm -hmm. he moves into working through the story of the Bible and how it points to Christ. So Yeah, what's interesting, you know, Irenaeus is uh, against heresies as such kind of like the foundational, the, uh, you know, his summa, for lack of a better word. Right. I mean, demonstration wasn't found until 1904 in some right. library. Um, and so it's difficult, it's difficult to ascertain the um, influence that this work may have had in his day. Mm. but it certainly represents how were Christians catechized, right? Like right. what were the things that they were told? I mean, he writes this to a person and says, this is what the Christian faith is. And so when he describes a Christian faith, uh, kind of what you were alluding to earlier, it's not an organized set of systematic uh, doctrines necessarily, 
but it is a very ordered theology. It's right. this is who God is. This is what we say about scripture. This is who Jesus is. And so we get an early glimpse, you know, within basically the grandchildren of the apostles in mm. the faith of mm. this is what John told us the Bible's about. This is what John said about who God is. So we don't have Nicene Trinitarianism here before, uh, per se, but we certainly have this Not explicitly example. at least. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But we have certainly have this idea of the Father, Son, and Spirit being uh, mm -hmm. divine, having this authority, having this order, uh, and that the baptism is in their name, right? right? And that all of this kind of focuses on that. So that's right. Well, let's, uh, let's maybe mention a couple of favorite points yeah. here. I, we don't want to spoil uh, the text for those of you who haven't read it yet. We just want to give you some broad strokes to help you uh, read it if you've never read it before. So what are some, what are some places that you would point out, Brandon? And Brandon actually has the volume that we recommended you buy. Yeah. Let's show me on YouTube for those watching. I, I on the other hand, <laughs> have my printed out copy from when I was a poor doctoral student. A patristic um, scholar of patristic scholars right there with this printed out version. That's right. And it's not even the translation that we recommended <laughs> either. Of course it's not, because that would be a copyright violation. Um, hey, -o. hey, so yeah, I don't have the page numbers and, and all that. I'll just try to mention section numbers when I um, yeah. mention what I'm going to mention. But Ray, why don't you point out some places that you would want to note for us? Yeah, I mean, I think, I feel like a lot of what we've talked about so far has been part one, kind of the mm -hmm. theological presuppositions and here's mm -hmm. some basic things. But when he gets into part two, um, in the in the translation that we use, uh, part two is called the demonstration from the prophets. And it's really, like you said, a tour de force of biblical theology in a very short oh, yeah. time, right? I mean, yep. he just says, chapter 43, in the beginning with the father. Okay, so mm -hmm. what do we say about who Jesus is? Then foreseen by Abraham, speaking with Moses, foreseen by Jacob. Uh, the father and son are both Lord. He uses Psalm 110, which is a huge uh, passage in the early church. Uh, the Lord said to my Lord, said at my right hand, well, who is the Lord and, and who's the other Lord and what's mm -hmm. he doing? Right. Mm -hmm. And he just walks through here and says, this is about Jesus. And 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 he doesn't do, I mean, it, some of them are only a paragraph or two. He's not doing some wild, uh, you know, speculative thing. He's basically saying, Hey, this passage says, this sounds a lot like Jesus. This passage says, this. sounds a lot like Jesus. That's right. And so he's not giving you, like, we have all these debates now um, about, you know, what is it, who's the Messiah and, and how, what's a fulfillment, what's not a fulfillment, what's typology and what's not, mm -hmm, what's allegory. Mm -hmm. And those are worthy questions. But I think if you just read part two without all of that in the back of your mind, I think you can just read through it and go, oh, yeah, this is a guy talking about how Jesus fulfills the Old Testament. And it's very clear. And, um, Again, there's just not a lot of, uh, it doesn't go at pains to describe what he's trying to do. He just assumes that it's true. And I think yeah. that's something to take from it as you read, is that he is just assuming that the Bible is about Jesus. He, he's not um, making some apologetic argument for the truthfulness of scripture or whatever. He's just saying, no, scripture is true and here's why. Right. I actually do uh, wonder, this is, this is tangential, but... Um, I was trying not to be, but here we are. I know. I, sorry. <laughs> uh, squirrel. So uh, you, you said something along the lines of, you know, the debates about what's allegory or not allegory, <laughs> the debates about what's typology and what's not are fine. Yeah. I actually wonder if uh, reading this particular text might confront that particular question. So is, is there actually a distinction between legitimate typology and illegitimate typology right in, in this in the sense that um people are making that distinction based on external categories yeah. right so so i could i could see somebody saying well that's an illegitimate typological reading because it's not in the text yeah yeah sure okay that's fair right um but people make distinctions about the typology based on external parameters that they decide right so oh it can't be typology unless the new testament identifies it as such yeah what why, why is that why would that be the case right and and i think reading irenaeus confronts us with that question now maybe that's where you end up and you have particular reasons for that but my point is that i think reading through demonstration has has to make you 
really wrestle mm -hmm. with those kinds of external parameters? Are they actually true? Now, now yeah. you might read it and you might think to yourself, okay, yeah, some of this was poetic. I don't agree. I still think that these external parameters I put up are correct. Well, fine, right? Yeah. But um, I, I think often we, we just sort of settle on these, these rules of interpretation that are really put in place by modernity. Um, yeah. and, and we haven't really wrestled with them sufficiently. So yeah, I, I, I suppose I would say, if, you know, just for instance, in uh, section 33, Irenaeus says, this is book one, uh, section 33. And this is going to be a slightly different translation, obviously. Uh, Just as through a disobedient virgin, man was stricken down and fell into death. So through the virgin who was obedient to the word of God, man was reanimated and received life. For the Lord came to seek again the sheep that was lost and man it was that was lost. And for this cause, there was not made some other formation, but in that same which has its descent from Adam, he preserved the likeness of the first formation for it was necessary that Adam should be summed up in Christ, that mortality might be swallowed up and overwhelmed by immortality and Eve summed up in Mary, that a virgin should be a virgin's intercessor and by a virgin's obedience undo and put away the disobedience of a virgin. And the trespass, which this is now section 34, the trespass, which came by the tree was undone by the tree of obedience. When hearkening unto God, the son of man was nailed to the tree, thereby putting away the knowledge of evil and bringing in and establishing the knowledge of good. So, and I could keep reading, but the point is he makes these, he makes these two typological connections between Eve and Mary, first of all, and then between tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of the cross. On the yeah. other <clears throat> Neither of those are quote unquote identified by the new Testament. Um, uh, in, in another place, Irenaeus compares <laughs> compares the virgin birth to e to Adam uh, being created out of untilled soil. Yeah, and so not to get too graphic, right? But um, Mary, by virtue of being a virgin, um, mm -hmm. has has not been touched. And Adam, the dust of the ground that he's made from, has not been touched tilled. Mm -hmm. Is that a legitimate typological connection? Right. Right. What are your What are your criteria for mm -hmm. quote unquote legitimate? So I, I think I think reading through Irenaeus actually confronts some of these. I I don't want to call them assumptions because I I'm not saying they're necessarily incorrect, but I just I think we assume these kind of rules for typology. Yeah. And reading through this text is going to make you think about those. Yeah, I think no, I agree with that. Um, you know, one of the things that he, even like the example you brought up of the untilled ground, that's one of those ones where if you were at church on Sunday morning and your pastor were preaching through a passage. Now, I do want to, I do want to say caveat as well. One of the things that, that Bear does really well in the translation that we've recommended is he puts footnotes to scripture constantly in there and shows mm -hmm. here's where Irenaeus is getting that. So Irenaeus mm -hmm. isn't even making these up as a rhetorical flourish. He's actually connecting them to first Corinthians and other places. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. so it's not like Irenaeus isn't using scripture yeah. to interpret scripture. Uh, but even so, if you were sitting in your church and your pastor were preaching, uh, you know, let's say it's a, um, you know, Christmas Eve sermon about the virgin birth. And he says right. something like just as Adam, you know, tilled the ground or whatever. So in the same way, yeah, yeah you know, uses that same example. I have a right. feeling that most people sitting there would say that is a beautiful way to describe what God has done in Christ. Like, like they might just see it as an illustration or a rhetorical flourish, but they wouldn't disagree with it. But if you're bound up so much in all the debates about what is and isn't, you kind of miss the straightforward beauty of some of the things Irenaeus is doing. Right. So when I say, so when I say, you know, um, just read it for, just read it and just appreciate what he's doing and don't, you know, um, go through all of that. I think that's part of it is you don't have to agree with every single way that he has employed uh, type or something like that right. uh, to not be able to, to not be able to appreciate what he's doing. Right. Because right. ultimately you may disagree with some of his method, which again, he doesn't really feel the need to describe. He just kind of does what he does, but you may disagree with some of his method. Um, but I think, you know, particularly as evangelicals who we're speaking to as Baptists, we all affirm 
that the Bible is true, authoritative and non-contradictory and right. that it's, there's a unity there. And that is something I think, even if you might disagree, an evangelical Baptist reading this or any non-Baptist evangelical um, can appreciate that he is trying to make sense of the unity of scripture. And, you know, there's clear stuff in scripture about how Christ is the second Adam, right? So he's trying to right. say, okay, what does it mean for him to be the second Adam? So I think that's where we can hopefully, yeah, hopefully step back from some of the debates and just appreciate kind of the beauty of what he's doing. Yeah, that's right. And I think part two, he does that uh, particularly well. Yeah. A uh, couple other things I'll point out here and then I'll take it back to you, Brandon, if you have anything else you want to point out. Uh, section 43, which I think you referenced earlier. Yeah. Um, he's talking about, well, he starts talking about creation again and he says so then we must believe god in all things for in all things god is true now that there was a son of god and that he existed not only before he appeared in the world but also before the world was made moses who was the first that prophesied says in hebrew and then he quotes genesis 1 1 in hebrew which begins bereshit bara and so if you if you know hebrew you know that resh uh can be translated beginning but also can be translated firstborn Mm -hmm. uh, or son and uh so that's what Irenaeus actually does he says and this translated into our language is quote the son in the beginning god established now it, you know i i'm pointing that out not to say hey you need to adopt this understanding of hebrew and of genesis 1 1 but only to say a, a, a kind of common mischaracterization of early christian theologians is that they didn't know the languages and, and many of them especially later on really did fail to learn hebrew right but right. that's not true of everybody uh irenaeus quotes it here basil uh, of caesarea and um Ath he actually disagrees with athanasius on um some hebrew stuff going on in proverbs 8 right so that they, yeah. they don't they're not totally ignorant of hebrew um many of them so I just point that out to say this isn't, and just like you said, this isn't like he's going just off of his own poetic proclivities. He's actually trying to read the text carefully in making these kinds of typological connections and this holistically Christological reading. Um, the other thing I would point out is that after that section in section, later on in section 43 and then into section 44, um, he begins talking about Christ's appearances in the Old Testament. He makes allusion to Proverbs 8 in a number of places and then works through all that material. And finally, in section 47, um, he gets to this Trinitarian reading of all that material. He says, So then the, the Father is Lord and the Son is Lord, and the Father is God and the Son is God, for that which is begotten of God is God. So we have this kind of initial foray into. Uh, eternal generation of the son yeah and he goes on to say substance and power etc shown forth in the one god and then he talks about the difference between the son and the father in the economy all right yeah. so like brandon said early on irenaeus is not just regurgitating nicene trinitarianism because that would be an anachronism but we see the seeds of what would flower out into nicene yeah. trinitarianism in Irenaeus, and it's not that he's the first person to articulate these things it's that the seeds that he is planting of Nicene Trinitarianism are themselves from the seed of all Christian doctrine, which is scripture. Yeah. So in repeating scripture and in reading it carefully, in elucidating scripture, in our understanding of it, he's actually laying the foundation for what would later be Nicene Trinitarianism in, in, in Trinitarianism in some ways. Obviously, there are critiques to be made of some statements Irenaeus makes. But um, just to point out that, you know, the fourth century pro nicenes didn't make up yeah this stuff it was there from the beginning yeah and that's the you know when we go back and think through you know how we have these questions about how was the biblical canon formed for example well right. a lot of that is built around the idea that these are the things the apostles wrote there's authoritative and communal um agreement on who wrote it and what's accepted and what's not this is how gnostic gospels got kicked out early and often um it goes that way all the way through the Christian tradition, particularly through the first five, six centuries, right? Where you have this consistent, is this what scripture says? Is this what the apostles say? Let's test it. Mm -hmm. And this is where 
you get from even Justin Martyr is already doing this, right? He tells uh, in the dialogue with Trifo, he tells him the scriptures are not the Jewish people's scriptures if they deny Christ, because these were always about Christ, you know, let's talk about it. He'll walk through scripture. Now he's not nearly as, as clear and concise as Irenaeus is, uh, but Irenaeus uh, is largely dependent on Justin, right? And he really uh, obviously is, is indebted to Justin. Even if you go back to Ignatius and Clement and some of these that were writing, mm -hmm. probably while some of the apostles were still alive, uh, at least, you know, likely John and maybe some others, they're saying a lot of the same things that Irenaeus and Justin and Tertullian and Origen all right. the way to Athanasius are saying. So that where we go back to this idea of the rule of faith and this kind of uh, sixth sense culture of theology, Athanasius will say to Arius, well, if Jesus is created, if he's a created being, how can we worship him, right? Mm -hmm. Let's look at scripture and let's talk about the gospel of John, for example, and what does this mean? So this is what they're all doing. And so this is why I think it's helpful for us to read it and to think through what he's doing here, because what he does here, whether we accept it or not, or know it or not, our, uh, our theological presuppositions and some of our major um, beliefs and major convictions about what scripture is and who God is, is owed to the writings of Irenaeus and these others yeah. who, who we're going to be reading. We're, we're doing the same thing they're doing, whether or not we might agree or disagree with some of their methods. So I want to point out um, chapter 98 in the conclusion. Uh, he says this. Spoiler beloved, alert. Yeah, sorry. This is it's going gonna, it's gonna to surprise you. Uh, he starts his conclusion this way. This beloved is the preaching of truth. This is the character of our salvation. And this is the way of life, which the prophets announced. And Christ confirmed, and the apostles handed over to the church, and the whole world hands down to her children. So he he goes to the end here to say, "This is not. I'm not doing anything new. Mm -hmm. Right. This this is the Gnostics' problem is that they're doing new things." Yeah. He says, "I'm not doing anything new. I'm doing the thing that Jesus taught the apostles, and that the apostles taught us." And so again, I, I love how he keeps going back to the apostles because he's saying this authority comes from Christ Himself who right. is God in the flesh. And that's why I read the Bible this way, because yeah. this is what Jesus and the apostles were telling us to do. That's right. So he's not doing anything new or unique. And in fact, throughout all of the early church, you will see over and over again, uh, the church fathers uh, and the council saying, your biggest problem is that you're trying to be creative. You don't need to be creative. This has right. already been done, right? So let's just do it the way it's already been done, because that's the way Jesus said to. That's right. And this is the distinction between, I think, um, protestantism and roman catholicism and greek orthodoxy so uh, this is a, another tangent but real quick you know what we what we would say as protestants is that insofar as the early church was demonstrating continuity with christ first and foremost through the apostolic deposit that is scripture then yes we want to affirm tradition as authoritative not as supremely authoritative because only scripture holds that but derivatively so in other words if they're getting it from the bible then yeah we can say the tradition is is derivatively authoritative just as a sermon that's faithful to the set to the text should be authoritative in a local church not because it's supremely authoritative but because it's from scripture which is supremely authoritative right what happens with both roman catholicism and greek orthodoxy at least in the protestant's estimation is that the the demonstration of apostolicity which is exactly what Irenaeus is doing demonstration of the apostolic preaching the demonstration of apostolicity shifts from exclusively and ultimately moving back towards the bible um, and showing it from scripture it moves from that to scripture and some other external authority whether it's um the pope or uh you know the episcopacy whatever so the, this is the key difference, right? And, and you'll see in, in, in Irenaeus, but then especially later on, you'll see some of these writers refer to the authority of the tradition or the authority of what's been said before and on and on. And at some point that shifts from an authority that's recognized because it's faithful to scripture to an authority that's recognized because it's part of an office. Yeah. And, and, and that's the distinction that we want to make. So, you know, this will come up again really through Aquinas uh, as we talk about these books that, that, that um, we're going to see this kind of trajectory. But with Irenaeus, all he's really doing is reading the Bible. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. And, you know, uh, Luther is responding to a particular type of 
later medieval problematic Roman Catholicism. He's not reacting to right. 1500 years of church history. Right. And that's something that's just like an, ob it's, it's not obvious um, if you're not familiar with church history, but you, you see a, like you're saying, you see a shift much later than Irenaeus, Athanasius, yeah. even Aquinas, right? It's really, um, you know, what, 13th, 14th, 15th century is when you start to see some things start going uh, a little weird there, particularly with uh, the authority of Rome and the Pope and some of that kind of stuff where it really That's gets right. off the rails. Now, it, it develops that way a little bit, but it's not until, you know, well after 1000 AD before you really start seeing that problem arise right. in the way that it is. And so, again, we can still maybe disagree with how some of the, the bishopry worked and stuff like that. I mean, part, part of Irenaeus's um, authority comes from the fact that he is uh, the bishop of uh, Gaul, which is now uh, Lyon, France. I used to say lion, but that's the one I get made fun of for. Lions? So, Irenaeus, Lyon. Of, Irenaeus of lions? So uh, he, you know, he was the bishop of, and that's a, that's a extremely important city and an extremely important state in the Roman empire. And so he has a, a natural local communal authority because of what he's doing there. Um, that can turn into a bad thing, but it's not necessarily a bad thing, right? If Irenaeus is a good bishop who teaches scripture faithfully and catechizes people, uh, awesome. He's doing, he's doing his job, right? So. Right. I think we're done. Are we done with all of our um, uh, defending uh, Irenaeus against the Theobros, at least for today? At least for today. Yeah, I guess. I mean, I, I think it's funny that I brought up an example of Mary earlier. That was like yeah. a, it, that was like an indirect and in, in, uh, unintentional trigger. Just so remember, sure. Matthew, that, that I am associated with you, whether I want to be or not, when you do stuff like this. So just remember there are other people uh, yeah. who are involved in your, in your, uh, in your craziness. But, right. Oh, uh, no, I, yeah, I've, you're in my tornado of crazy. The Smitherson tornado. That's right. Okay. Well, we hope you enjoy the book. Uh, I, I think we're going to try to foster some discussion in some way towards the end of the month. So I'll be looking for that. Yep. And then in the meantime, uh, I'll close us with the grace, which is from second Corinthians 13, 14. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy spirit be with you all evermore. Amen.